Okay, uh, Naira Brown is going to be our guest speaker for uh, today. She's going to present uh, the uh, old back tunnel information. She's going to be uh, reviewing uh, what their, their habit, habits and habitats are, are going to be. And correct me if I'm wrong, Naira, but you are a current member of the past of uh, 20, Oh, gosh, I don't know. 2005 or something. Yeah, 2005. Like that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's a long time. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I wasn't even here. I mean, that was doing something else. Yeah. But, uh, I, I was just a baby back then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, years old. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I do appreciate the presentation because during my class in 2019, it was an option to go to the bathroom, and I chose not to. Um, oh, but, wow. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll follow the sword on that one, but I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the Bathroom 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 So thank you guys for actually showing up. I've been watching, um, it's very interesting, the people that are showing up in Zoom. And I noticed several of my volunteers that are in Zoom, shame on you, whoever you are, <laughs> for not being here in person. But Tyra came in person. Tyra did. And I would also leave, and is me? also a third yeah. volunteer. I have a couple of from the new class yeah. also, very excited about that. And then I do have to recognize the volunteer who has been volunteering longer than I have, who just decided to retire this year. And since she's here, Wilma, please stand up for a moment. Let's all give Wilma a hand. She volunteered 22 years at Old Tunnel. Wow. And I'm going to miss her very, very much. She, uh, she has been on many adventures with me. We drove all the way to New Mexico together one time to go do bat research. And so she hangs out. She's just as bad as I am, and that's what I love about her. So Wilma's well, been great. And I have a great – Lisa, also, I didn't recognize Lisa Flanagan's also been a volunteer. And uh, Chuck, back yeah. in the day, was a volunteer. So I've had quite a few um, – people here and I look forward to it you're pretty more. So if you haven't been to visit Old Tunnel, first I'll just give a little plug to the place that I work. And of course the main feature of our park is this old abandoned railroad tunnel. Uh, the tunnel was built in 1913. It was part of a very short rail line that went from Fredericksburg to Comfort. <laughs> and uh, so it's only about 23 miles, 23.9 miles. And it was very instrumental, though, back in those 1900s, because back then they were still using a horse and cart in the late 1800s to get into San Antonio. And it could take them up to seven days, depending on the weather. And so they wanted to get there quicker if they could. And so they had to build this tunnel because trying to go over the hill, they called it the big hill back then, it was hard. It was those steam engine trains there's no way that they could pull full freight cars and passenger cars over the top of the hill so they decided they would just take a hole through the hill <laughs> yes we're not getting the feet on the other side it's not it's not sharing your screen yeah. for some reason so yeah so we're gonna take a, a technical oh okay just a second let me see what's going on. all right let's see share screen share screen you want the one below it, don't you? Oh. If I don't, if I now, are you seeing it or not? Oh. If I don't share the whole screen, when I show my videos, they won't show because it opens up in a new okay, window. So now you're moving before you were just stationary. So it's working now? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Right. Okay, let me go <laughs> backwards. Now it's the top one. Yeah, I know. I'm pushing both, and it's not mm -hmm. doing either way. Okay. Let's just try this. Nope. Don't you love technology? It's amazing. <laughs> when things don't work the way they're supposed to, let's try it. Let me try something else. Here. Let's start over. I've done many of these programs, so I'm very... There we go. Yay! Okay. All right. So anyway, 
know, they dug a hole through the hill and um, you know, they get it, no big deal. But if you guys are from the hill country, you know, digging a hole in the hill country is not a lot of fun. So it's a 920 foot tunnel and it only took them about five months to dig it and they dug it by hand. So pretty amazing feat. So in itself, it's a pretty cool history. People can come out and hike the trail and look at the tunnel. It's open. The park is free during the day, sunrise till five o'clock. You can just come out and hike our short, short nature trails about half a mile long. But of course, the main feature and the reason we get most of the people out there and the reason I need volunteers is because we do have three million bats that come and roost inside the tunnel. Uh, this is migration time. They're just showing up right now. So uh, the best months to come to watch our bats are in August and September. The full colony, is, the pups are juveniles by then and they're flying. And we have that's when we have three million. At the beginning of the summer, we have about a million or so. But if you see a few hundred thousand or a million or three million or 20 million, you go to Bracken Cave, you're still seeing a whole lot of bats. So <laughs> it's not going to be disappointing if you only see a few thousand of them. How many of you have been to Old Tunnel? Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Except for you. <laughs> um, how many of you have been other places to go watch bats? Because we're really fortunate here in Texas. You guys live in the baddest state of the United States of America. Brag about that to all of your friends. So we have the most diversity of species out of any state. I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute. But just to give you, um, I know many of you have said you've seen it, our emergence, but I want to share with you, this is a video, a very short video of our bat emergence. It may take a minute or two for it to get going, but here you go. So <laughs> I took this video in the dark with an infrared camera, so that's why the bats look white. Um, they're not all albinos, although we do have an al albino or two. We usually say one per million, one per million albino bats. I have a couple other videos I want to share with you. This one is really cool. Um, these are views that most people don't get to see because we don't allow people down on the bridge to watch the bats. But this is what they look like when they come directly out of the tunnel. I think, I think it's going to, it may not work. Um, yeah, some of my videos, I was afraid of this. Some of them may not work, so that's okay. Let's see if you can. You can hear it, though. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> and that's me. I tripped over a log trying to walk backwards. <laughs> I can tell you. I can give you the experience, even though you can't see it. And then this, this is. I hope this one works. I took it below. I wonder if I could just turn the sound off. Turn her off. What's what? Somebody was talking. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Oh, it's not going to work either. I'm sorry, guys. You know what? I can. You have a Facebook page, yes? Is that right? Yeah. So I will share my videos to the Facebook page, and that way people can go and watch them later. So. But this is a really cool video that I took. The one that says "Back in the Sky." I stood underneath the bats. And it looks like that. It's a, it really is a tornado. For you guys who've gone to see it, you probably see how it looks like a tornado as they spiral up to get above the tree line. And I was standing right underneath it, and it was like being the eye of the tornado. It was really, really cool. So I'll try to share that with you guys later on your Facebook page. So, so just to kind of talk about bats in general, there are over 1,400 species of bats, and they live everywhere in the world except for the same places that we can't live because they can't find the things they need to survive. So extremely cold and extremely hot desert areas, that's where bats aren't going to be found. What's interesting is, is the top button, the red thingy? Yeah, yeah I can't turn her off. <laughs> <laughs> is she trying to turn me off? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I first started uh, studying bats, which was about 18 years ago, this number right here was 1,118 species. And so in 18 years, we have discovered new mammals. And I think that's amazing. I like to share that with kids because, you know, a lot of kids think there's nothing new out there, nothing cool to discover out in nature, but there are. Um, especially with bat species because they're hard to study. Uh, they fly at night. Sometimes they fly as high as 10,000 feet and as fast as 60 miles an hour. <laughs> so it's a challenge 
to even catch a bat and to be able to look at them up close. But new technologies are allowing us to study them closely. And so that's why we have discovered so many new species. So just to start out, I want to show you some of the ones that I think are really cool. I wish I could show you all of them because I do think all bats are beautiful. That's just me. And you may not agree with me as you see some of these photos. But <laughs> this one is found in Mexico. And a lot of the common names bats are called by has to do with where they're found, maybe who discovered them, or what they look like on the outside. And so this one is found in Mexico. And the guy that discovered him thought that his ears looked like funnels. <laughs> and they named him the funnel eared bat. <clears throat> and you can see he's got these little tiny eyes, right? Really beautiful orange fur. <laughs> How many of you... Since you all seem to know about bats, I'm, I'm expecting everyone will get this right, but how many of you think bats cannot see well? How many of you think bats are blind or have bad eyesight? Anyone? <laughs> it's okay, because a lot of people did. Even scientists thought that bats were blind, because look, they have these little tiny eyes, and what do they use at night to help them find their food? Their at the location. But when scientists started to study bats closely, they found that bats can see just as well as we can. They have really good eyesight. The reason they use that location is because these bats, most of them are looking for little tiny insects in the dark. So I compare it to us. If we walked outside, most of us, maybe you don't have to wear glasses like I do, but we have good eyesight for the most part. But if we're outside and it's pitch black, what could we use to help us find our way? A flashlight. So at the location, is like a flashlight to a bat. It's helping them be able to track down the food that they want to eat in the dark, even though they can see really well. So based on the fact that you guys know that bats are called their names by what they look like, I'm going to see if any of you can guess the name of this bat. I'm hoping that my video will work, so we'll see what happens. So pay close attention to the way that he looks on the outside. And it's not going to work either. Oh, please. Okay, well, I was afraid that usually I use my own computer, uh, and that way I make sure my videos play. Sometimes you need special programs to get them to work. But we had you guys have such a fancy setup here, I was afraid to use my own computer in case of the Facebook and all that kind of stuff. But that's okay. We're going to continue on. I do have a bat for you to guess the name of in just a minute. But these two bats here are um, really cool bats. You can see these fuzzy looking things on their noses. This one is called the sword nosed bat. And this one is called the striped hairy nosed bat. You can see his whole body, he's got these white stripes going down his back. And then check out, he's got hair going off of his nose. Now, these two things on their noses are very important to these bat species. They're adaptations that these bats have, they're called nose leads. So instead of making their echolocation calls through their mouth, they actually make the sound through their nose. So the sound travels up their nose leaf, and they can point it in the direction their prey is going, and that's how they can track their food. So if they didn't have those nose leaves, the sound would just kind of blast out everywhere. So it's a very important adaptation for these two bat species. Now this guy's one of my favorite, because as you can see, his hair looks a lot like mine. So <laughs> I get up in the morning, and I have this really cool hairdo. This is, I tell kids that he's the rock and roll bat and he's got a mohawk, right? You are looking at his profile. So here is his ear, here's his eye, here's his nose. This crest of hair, this happens to be the male bat. And just like I'm sure many of you are birders or you've seen nature shows where the male will do a dance and display their feathers. Some peacocks, for instance, the male does a really cool feather display. Um, oftentimes when they want to attract the bat, uh, their, their mate. Well, this guy makes his crest of hair, his mohawk is very attractive to the lady bats, and he displays it during mating season. So that kind of makes him kind of a unique bat. This is called the Chaplin's Free-Tailed Bat. And then there are bats that look like other animals. This is a favorite of kids when I usually show this picture. And this is the bat that's found in Australia. It's called the Ghost Face Bat. He also has a nose leaf that you can see right here. Um, he is what we call a true carnivore. Um, bats, they, they eat insects, which you can consider to be kind of a meaty substance. But he eats small birds and even eats other kinds of bats. So I like to talk about kids love, you know, that gross stuff. So I say he's a cannibal, <laughs> a cannibal bat, this guy right here. He's got these really cool um, looking ears. Um, 
You know, a lot of kids say he looks like a llama or a bunny rabbit. And then there are bats that have really cute faces. If you go to the zoo or if you watch a show on TV that's about bats, usually these are the ones that you're going to see. They're called flying foxes because they have a fox-like shaped face. They got these really big kind of puppy dog looking eyes, very cute bats. <laughs> they're found in places where they have a lot of tropical conditions because they're fruit eaters, these flying foxes. Now in comparison to this guy, what about this guy? He's cool, right? I love this guy. This guy proves that wrinkles are good adults and everyone is <laughs> adult in the audience, right? If you notice, a lot of the bats, when you look at them up close, they have all these folds of skin on their face. This is the wrinkle face bat. And all those folds of skin are really important to bats because they absorb sound. So when he sends out a general location call, the sound comes back. It travels up through these folds of skin, and it helps the sound get up to his ears. So it's really an adaptation that is helping with echolocation, those folds of skin. Now, this guy is pretty cool looking. I also think he looks like an alien because he's got these big bulbous eyes, right? What about this guy? <laughs> this is the Yoda bat. <laughs> and I think it's pretty cool. Uh, this bat was discovered in Africa. This bat and the next bat I'm going to show you <clears throat> was discovered in the last 10 years in Africa because they were going into places that they hadn't studied before. And the scientist who discovered these two bats, he was a fan of Star Wars. So he gave their common name, the Yoda bat, and then we have his buddy, the Chewbacca bat. <laughs> cool, right? Now, if any of you um, have young kids hanging out with you, they would probably argue that this bat looks more like Shrek, yeah. which I think as well. He's got that kind of funky looking nose right here. But another really cool example to share with kids that they can have relate to Star Wars for one thing, but also really cool that we've discovered these bats in the last 10 years, which is pretty awesome. All right, so I couldn't get you to guess the other name of the bat, and no old time old people can answer this question, but what is the name of this bat, do you think? If you look at it and look at the wings, when you know the common names often have to do with what they look like on the outside. Any guesses? This is not a free tail bat, though. This bat, if you look at the wings in particular, it kind of gives you a big hint. That would be a good guess, you know. It's more to do with the color. That's very close. Yellow wings. The yellow wing bat. I get um, a lot of butterfly bat from kids. <coughs> they call it the butterfly bat. But just to kind of give you an example of the different kinds of common names that are bats are known by. Now, bats also come in all sizes. This is the smallest bat in the world. It's found in Thailand. It's called the bumblebee bat. The body of this bat is only about as big as a jelly bean, and it weighs less than a penny. And you can see I can set them on my thumb, and it wouldn't fall off. And when their wings are open, they're only about this big. It looks like a little butterfly when it's flying around. And really cool bat. They eat little tiny gnats and midges and things like that where they're found. And then in comparison, the largest bats in the world are found in Indonesia, and they're called the giant flying fox. <laughs> and from this wingtip to this wingtip, the largest of these bats can have a six-foot wingspan. So that's longer than I can stretch my arms. If, if any of you are six feet tall, then stand up and you can see, there you go, how long the, that would be. And if that makes you a little bit nervous, we do not have bats this big in Texas. In fact, oh, they don't live in the United States. They Again, they're in tropical places where they have a lot of more fruit than we have around here. We do have the largest bat in the United States in Texas. It's found out in Big Bend. It's called the Western Massive Bat. And it has about a 20 inch wingspan. Pretty cool bat. Uh, Big Bend is my favorite part of Texas for many reasons, but most of one of the biggest reasons is because that's where the greatest diversity of bat species are. 21 species hang out in Big Bend. Mm -hmm. And when you catch a Western Mastiff bat, I don't know if any of you have um, done any bird surveys with somebody that they use mist nets to catch birds. Well, you do the same thing with bats, it's just a different kind of netting. And you set them up over water sources because bats will go down to get a drink of water and these nets are so fine they don't see them <clears throat> and they'll get caught up in the net and then you go and get them out. 
And when you release a bat, you usually just put them on your hand like this and they'll just drop down and kind of fly away because most bats are medium sized, weigh about half an ounce or so. But Western master bats are, are bigger and so they have a harder time getting up in the air. So when you go to get them in the air, you have to throw them up in the air to give them a little bit of leverage. So it's just show you how big in comparison to most of our bat species. So, but none is big, none quite that large. Now here are some of the things I'm sure all of you've heard at least one of these, and maybe you even thought some of these things back in the past. Um, I have heard every single one of these things several times, and I know several, uh, Wilma has probably also heard this millions of times than any other volunteer. Um, many of them make me very upset when I hear people say it because the bats are blind is okay because a lot of people have that misconception. But one that bothers me a whole lot, my worst one is this one right here. Bats are blind mice. <laughs> they're not. People um, associate mice, they're, they're a rodent, they're a nuisance. They poop all over your house and they chew up all of your stuff. And that um, I don't want to associate bats with that. So I like to point out, because they all say, oh, they're just flying mice, mice with wings. That's what I hear a lot. When they trace the genetics of bats, they found that bats are more closely genetically related to dolphins than they are to mice. So you, everyone loves dolphins, right? So that's what I like to associate with bats. So, um, and bats aren't like mice. Mice have several litters of mice several times a year. Most bat species only have one pup a year. So they don't become, a, you know, too many of them. In fact, they can die off pretty quickly if the disease starts affecting them. Um, another one that is a big misconception is people think that all bats have rabies, and that is not true either. One half of 1% of bat species can get rabies. So if you think of 1,400 species with millions of individual bats, that's a very small number in comparison to how many bats there are in the world. A bat with rabies is not like another rabid mammal Whatever mental image you have, Cujo or Old Yell or whatever, frothing at the mouth, aggressive, growling. A bat that gets rabies, what happens is they become really stiff and they can't cling to the surface that they normally roost on. So what happens is they end up on the ground. And that's where the problem lies. Because you see this little bat, especially if you don't know better, and you know, a lot of times you hear about kids picking up a bat on the ground. Your instinct is, oh, it's a little bat, something's wrong with it, and you want to go pick it up. And it's a wild animal. Whether it has rabies or anything else, it's going to bite you in self-defense. So just never, ever touch a bat. If there's a bat that needs to be moved, animal control. They're the ones that need to come and take care of. Yes, ma'am. How do bats get rabies? That's a very good question. <laughs> they do nip at each other in the roost, so they can spread it amongst themselves. It doesn't happen very often, though, because that rat, that bat that's sick, they ostracize it and they start pushing it out of the roost, and it ends up on the ground pretty quickly. And if it's in a cave or like in a tunnel, for instance, I'll talk about what takes care of it pretty quickly when it gets on the ground. But um, how the first bat ever got rabies? That's like the chicken and the egg, or whatever that that saying is. We don't know exactly sure. There has been some research done and like speculation that it was actually a plant-borne virus that started uh, rabies and bats at some point, but that's just speculation, so I don't have a good answer to that question. But they can spread it amongst themselves, but it doesn't happen. You would never, ever have a rabid colony of bats. That just wouldn't happen. So they die pretty quickly. And they don't froth in the mouth and become aggressive. They just get really stiff and kind of end up on the ground. Now, these are some of the cool things about bats. I won't read all of them off. Um, one that I like to point out, I used to make this joke about this, but I'm not married anymore, but I wanted to say the oldest living bat in the world was my mother-in-law. <laughs> uh, anyway, I can't make that joke. Either, but it's really cool, though. Um, this bat looks, sorry about that, was caught in Russia, actually. And what's amazing, there are a few things that are amazing. First of all, uh, they caught this bat, they tagged it and released it, and they caught it again, the very same bat, which is hard to do, hard to catch the same bat twice. And when they aged it, they found that it had lived to be 41 years old. So that's really long-lived for a really tiny mammal. Um, most bat species here in the United States considered to be medium-sized, like Mexican free-tailed bats, for instance, can live up to 15 years in a while. 
Now, the really large bats, like the flying foxes that we've been looking at, they can live up to 25 years in the wild. So they're very long-lived, which is also a pretty cool thing. A lot of scientists and researchers are studying bats because they age so well. Up until the time they die, like female, Mexican free-tailed bat females can give birth. And they're healthy, and they can ward off viruses. And so a lot of scientists are studying bats because of these properties that they have naturally in them to see how they can relate it to humans. So there's many things that we're learning about bats. My son um, is a very intelligent, much more, much more smart than I am, and um, much smarter than I am. He is a PhD student, and he's studying telomere length. Uh, and comparing it in bats and humans. Uh, telomeres has something to do with aging, and it's pretty interesting stuff, way over my head, but kind of cool to think about. And um, bats are also very clean. If you were to see them hanging out in the roost, they are like cats. They lick themselves, and the mothers, I've seen them use their little tiny claws to come through their pup's fur when it first starts coming in. They'll clean their babies. And so their bats are actually really clean animals. So you might wonder, well, how is that possible? They're hanging upside down and they go to the bathroom. This is the number one question I get from kids. <laughs> so be prepared for this if you volunteer at Old Tunnel. So I did some in-depth research. <laughs> and actually when bats go to the bathroom, they turn and they hang from their thumbs. And so all of that just drops out. It doesn't roll down their fur or get caught up in their fur. And it was really interesting. I found this out from this African girl. She kept a blog. And she had a bat that roosted on her porch outside her window, and she kept a blog diary of what happened, and she reported what happened with the bat. So that's how I found out the answer to that question. So. All right, so some other cool things about bats. We have a lot of similarities between us and bats. Uh, scientists named the order of the bat Chiroptera because the bones in their wing are so similar to our human hand. They have thumbs just like we talked about, just like we do. You can see that they have five fingers. And then what else do they have right here that we have? Oh, no. Knuckles. Bats can bend and fold the bones in their wings, which makes them really agile flyers. I've seen a bat use their wing like a hand, flying like this, catch them off in their wing, and bring it up to their mouth to eat, all in just a beat of their wings, which is pretty cool. So they have some of the same similarities. Also, if you look at their skeleton, Rib cage is a lot really similar to ours. Their feet do face this way, not the same as ours. Gives them that ability to hang upside down and release really easily. Bats are in a relaxed position when they're hanging upside down. So if you had, I tell kids to pretend you're a bat and clench your toes in your shoes and leave your toes like that for the rest of the day. All of us would be uh, cramping up, right? But a bat, they actually move their hips and that's their hips. Um, change when they go into roost, their hips move, and that helps them cling to the surface. They're really not holding on with their toes. Their hips are helping them hold on, which is kind of cool. I'll see if my videos work, but um, scientists wanted to study bat flight, so they took bats into the lab. If we're lucky, if we're not, I, I can actually try to play these videos separately in a little bit. So when we get towards the end, I'm going to open up my files and see if I can get them to play differently. So uh, they, you can see how bats use their wings in these two vid the videos I'm going to show you. And also, in the video up there, you can see how they go in for a landing and they grab on with their thumbs. So they have a lot of unique abilities. A lot of the drone planes that you guys see, or maybe you even have one, they pattern those drone planes after bat flight uh, because bats have such unique kind of flight ability. So again, another example of things that we get from bats that you might not think about. Now, under that two, a uh, big order of Chiroptera, they have two suborders. They have the megabats, which are the flying foxes. And then here in the United States, we have the microbats, which are the bats that we have here in Texas. Uh, echolocation, I talked a little bit about it. If you guys were outside and bats are echolocating, can we hear it? For the most part, we cannot. Most bats echolocate above the range, the frequency that we could hear. The scientists wanted to study bats without having to grab them and hold them. So they invented machines called bat detectors. And what it does, it slows down the rate of the call to a sound that you can hear. It makes an audible sound. We'll see what happens when I try to play this. This is what it sounds like. The
obviously heard that buzzing noise, right? We call that a feeding buzz. So what happens is these bats are constantly sending out pulses of sound and it bounces off everything in front of them. So it'll bounce off you if you're outside and it gives that bat a mental image of what the sound bounced off of. It doesn't, he's not gonna say, hey, that's a person and that's a tree or whatever, but he's gonna say, that's not something I wanna eat. Then when he figures out that the sound bounces off something he does want to eat, he'll start speeding up those pulses of sound to 200 pulses a second. And that's what makes a buzzing noise on the bat detector. And it's one way for us to identify where bats are feeding in different areas so we can like protect different habitats and things like that. But also it can help us identify what bats are feeding on to what kind of uh, food sources that they're using. So echolocation is a really great ability for bats. There are some bats whose echolocation is so fine tuned that they can detect something as fine as a human hair from 30 feet away. So that would mean if I pulled out one of my hairs and I don't have very many, but if I pulled out one and I dropped it, if you were in the back of this room, if you were a bat, you would be able to see it and hear it hit the ground. So really, really amazing. Now they do eat a variety of food. We talked a little bit about some of the things that they eat. I just love this, this picture. Just check out how high you can get his tongue. I'll lift his eyeball. <laughs> Everything in this picture, a bat has made a contribution to. So all of us have to say we have, we are benefiting from bats. Not only do they contribute to everything in this picture, but if any of you have anything made with cotton, and I can probably say all of us have a t-shirt or socks or some kind of clothing, a bat has helped you. Because bats eat insects that affect these crops, or they could possibly be actually eating their fruit or helping you pollinate flowers. So this is a, this is a striped-faced bat. It's found in Africa. And you can see the different kinds of fruit that they eat and why they're important. Because there's a bat found in West Africa, it's called the hammer-headed fruit bat. This is just an example of one fruit-eating bat species. And they say in the areas where it's found that they're responsible for 98% of forestry growth because they spread so many seeds when they're flying. So very important in seed distribution. And not only are they distributing the seeds, they're fertilizing them on the way out, right? Guano, great fertilizer, great fertilizer. And in fact, um, I have a lots of biology uh, student friends. And you know, if you've been a biology student, any of you, I know Lee was a biology student, uh, you will study anything when you have a project that you have to study. And so my friend decided to prove that bad guano is a better fertilizer than any other type of fertilizer. And so he took guano into the lab and he took other fertilizers into the lab. And sure enough, the plant that he fertilized with guano grew almost twice as fast as the others. So guano is very rich in nitrates and it definitely will help things grow. Now we do have here in Texas, we don't have fruit eating bats, but we have a couple of nectar feeders. This is a Mexican long nose bat. And you can see how his nose is perfectly adapted to fit down into the cactus flower, right? Check it out. The nectar is way down here at the base of the flower. So you can see he's got to stick his face in there and his face is gonna get covered in pollen. So very important poll uh, helping with pollination. I'll try these videos, but if not, we'll come back to them in a minute. Yeah, I think I think what actually happens is um, when I have all my videos on the flash drive or my external drive, if it has a different drive number than whatever I plugged it into, that's why it's not finding them. But I will show them all to you at the end because we'll go if I have enough time to do so. So. Uh, I have some videos that are really cool to show you. Uh, not only do they have this really cool face that fits into the flowers, they also have a really long tongue, just like butterflies to help them get down to the nectar. And I heard somebody say agave back there, and that is exactly right. They're the number one pollinator of the agave cactus. Everyone know what we get from agave? <laughs> it's a very special bat in my heart right here. <laughs> All right, so, but again, most of our bats in Texas are insectivores. Uh, this is a hoary bat. It's one of our really bigger bats, uh, not the biggest, but one of the bigger size ones. Really beautiful, different colored fur, very fluffy, the hoary bat. And they do eat moths, but they, there are also bats, you know, that eat mosquitoes. We'll talk about them in a second. This is my favorite Texas bat species. 
sorry, Mexican free-tail bats. They're not my favorite. <laughs> but this is a beautiful bat. I mainly found out in West Texas. It's called the pallid bat. You can see he's got this pale, translucent wings. You can see right through them when they're flying. Lots of teeth. He's a very ferocious-looking bat. He mainly lives out in West Texas, and he, he's a gleaner. So instead of catching his food in flight, he has to try to find it on the ground while he's flying about six feet above the ground. And he does that using echolocation, which is amazing. He's echolocating off of desert floor, for instance, and rocks and cactus and all kinds of things. But he can, he can detect a scorpion walking on the ground six feet above the ground, just using echolocation. Because he also eats grasshoppers, which in large numbers can do damage to crops. But he also eats scorpions and centipedes. So he's immune to the sting. That scorpion can sting him as much as he wants, and he doesn't care. He's going to just keep chomping down on him. Really cool bat species. Something else that's really interesting about this bat is, as I mentioned, it's mainly found out in West Texas. And I, um, I get the honor of sometimes helping with research out there. A lot of San Angelo State uh, University students and even other universities do research out there. Uh, Lauren Ammerman wrote the Bats of Texas book by the way, and she does a lot of research out there. And we were catching these pallid bats, and we kept seeing pollen on their faces. And we knew that they roost. They actually hang out in cactus flowers. That's where they roost during the daytime. So we set up infrared cameras around these cactus to watch the bats coming out of the roost at nighttime. And what, we, what they saw, not me, but what they saw, but I did get to help with the research, which is kind of cool, but what they saw were that these bats were not only roosting in the flowers, they were feeding on the nectar. And it is the first ever reported case of an insectivorous bat feeding on nectar, which is really, really cool. Something to brag about for Angelo State University, but pretty interesting stuff. Did they, did they land or was he just they will, swooping? They will land on the ground. And they, that's how they catch them on the ground, exactly right. And they have a little bit hard time getting off the ground because bats' bones are solid. They're not hollow like birds' bones are. So they need to have a little bit of, they prefer to have a little elevation beneath them to help them get up in the air. But they can flap their wings and take off in the air. It just takes them a little bit of momentum to get up off the ground. Now, in other countries, there are bats that like to go fishing. This is a greater bulldog bat. He uses his claws as his fishing pole, goes down and catches fish. Also in other countries, there are bats that eat frogs. Kids always cringe when they see this because there's a lot of frog lovers out there. And I like frogs too. So this is why I like to talk about nature. It's amazing the way nature works. These frogs, these bats live in tropical areas. So all of you know, there's a lot of poisonous frogs out there, right? In those tropical places. So the bats, not only are finding the frogs by echolocation, but they also listen into the, the frog's croaking. And they can tell if the frog is poisonous or not by the sound that it makes somehow. They've adapted that ability. Well, the frogs have adapted the ability to know when bats are echolocating around them and they will stop croaking. So it makes it harder for them to find the ones they want to eat. Nature is cool, right? They give a chance to things, which is kind of cool. And then, of course, we can't talk about bats without talking about vampire bats. They do not suck blood, only in the movies. And um, if you look really closely, you can see you've got his little tongue stuck out. They lick the blood up with their tongue. So they do have two little sharp teeth. That is true. Um, vampire bats are pretty small, though. I magnified this picture so you can see them. But their body size is about the size of my thumb. Their wingspan is about like this, so not big, huge. If you watched Indiana Jones and he's being chased by those big, huge bats, those are not. It's CGI or whatever they use. Or maybe he used fruit bats for that movie. But they'll make one bite in the skin of the animal, and then they just keep licking. And as long as they keep licking the spot that they bit, they don't have to keep biting or chewing because vampire bats produce a blood thinner in their saliva that keeps the blood flowing. So a lot of times these animals don't even realize that that's there. They sleep through the whole process. And I have a video that I'll share with you guys in just a little bit that shows that a wild pig being fed on by a few little vampire bats and he snorts and snores the whole thing. You know, the them. So they only drink about two teaspoons of blood a night and they're only three times. And two of the species only feed on the blood of birds. There's only one that feeds on mammals. And another graduate student friend that I know is studying vampire bats in Mexico. 
By the way, there, none of them are found in the United States. They're only found in South America and Central American areas, none, none in Texas. So um, he was studying the stable isotopes that are found in the blood of these, the one, the common vampire bat that feeds on mammals. And he could tell by those stable isotopes the type of blood the bats were feeding on. And they found no traces of human blood. So it's very uncommon for people to hang out in the jungle area like they used to do. You know, most people have houses and things. So it'd be very unusual for that to happen. However, if you guys are going to go to Mexico for any reason and camp out, it's really important that you keep your feet in your sleeping bag because I have heard that they really like to feed on big toes. So keep that in mind. Big toes, yes. Now, here is an example of a bat. Vampire bats often feed down near the animal's feet. So they're on the ground a lot. And I mentioned already that they're heavy for their size. They have adapted the ability to use their, excuse me, sorry about that. They use their wing like a leg and their thumbs like feet. And they will run across the ground and propel themselves up in the air and help them get up into the air. So they have kind of a unique ability. Um, a lot of bat species can't do that as well as the vampire bat. Now, just a little uh, talk about predators. If you did go out to a bat site, these are some of the most common things you will see. Red-tailed hogs, owls, really common at most bat sites. Uh, snakes, I've been to, old tunnel, we have rat snakes, but they don't really hang out too much down by the tunnel. But if you ever go to James River Bat Cave over in Mason, I have seen coach whip snakes hanging right over the cave entrance, snatch a bat right out of the air as the bats are coming out. And then, of course, the predator that we have the most of and the one that I was going to associate with bats falling on the ground, why they don't last very long, are the domestic beetles. You can see this is a example where they kind of look like a really poly, but they hang out in the bad guano. And they're very important to the ecology in caves and in the tunnel because they are decomposers. By eating the bacteria in the bad guano, they're helping reduce those guano piles, which I can tell you in the tunnel, we don't have good rainfall washing through there. It's chest level in some places. So that decomposition process is really important because if the guano piles just kept growing and growing, the bats would abandon the roots. So again, it's that relationship of nature going on. But they are also flesh-eating beetles. So if a bat falls to the ground and it doesn't get up quick enough, those beetles are going to get on top of it, and then it can't move anymore. And with an hour or so, a bat this size, medium size bat, will be totally skeletonized. It's a, it, it's a terrible thing to think about. I'm a bat lover, and I don't like to think about it. But here's something to consider. If a bat fell to the floor in the roost, and it didn't get up pretty quickly to crawl away or fly away, do you guys think it was healthy in the first place? Probably not. It was probably sick or injured in some way, and it was going to die anyway. And so that's just how nature works. Um, also, a really important fact that I want to share about these beetles is they are responsible for that really nice aroma that you smell. When you, the bats do not stink. Don't be saying my bats stink if you come out to Old Tunnel because it's not the bats. A byproduct of the decomposition process of the beetles decomposing the bat guano produces ammonia. So they produce that really pungent odor that you smell when you go out to a bat site. So just to keep that in mind. How, I forgot how long I have, an hour or 45 minutes? 45 minutes. Okay. All right. I'm just going to skip through the rest of these really quick so I can show you the videos. Is everybody okay with that? Just a yes. few more things. Yes, sir. Did you see the... Horse and wildlife horse on three days. We're talking about the bat falcon. I year. did, yeah. I've never seen any Yeah. First ever seen in the U.S. Yeah, I did. Somebody, one of my volunteers shared that with me. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, just some of the things I want to show just quickly are that they live in many places here in Texas mm -hmm. under bridges. TxDOT builds the bridges so that bats will roost under them because they know how important they are to agriculture. And that's kind of what I want to get to. I'm just going to kind of skip through these. So I want to talk about why we want to keep bats around. Not only are they cool to watch and we learn many things from them, but just because of their importance to agriculture, especially here in Texas. So the Mexican free-tailed bat is our most common bat species here in Texas. There's about 100 million of them that migrate into Texas from Mexico. So there's a lot. If you want to impress your friends, 
and bats are flying around to point up and say, hey, Mexican free tilt bat, and you're probably right, 99% of the time, around here especially in Central Texas. And they get their name because they do have a free hanging tail. You see that? That's why they're called free tail. And we call them Mexican free tail because that's how we do things in Texas. You know, they do come from Mexico, but they are also known as a Brazilian free tail bat, same bat species, just, just different common names, the way that we refer to them. Uh, the females are coming up here pregnant. This is a baby right here on her mom. The babies, these mothers are really tough. First of all, they give birth hanging upside down for a bat. They turn and they hang from their thumbs. And then they catch their pup in their tail membrane. And they catch a pup that weighs about a third of their weight. So that doesn't sound like much unless you think about if we weighed 120 pounds, that would mean our baby weighed 40 pounds when it was born. So really, really, really strong mothers. But what's really amazing about the free tails being here is that they consume, for the most part, the corn earworm, the cotton bull, or moth. And these moths, this is what they look like. You can see this cotton one right here. They migrate up to Texas from Mexico. And they lay their, their eggs on corn and cotton crops. One moth will lay a thousand eggs during its lifetime. There are hundreds of thousands of moths coming into Texas. So if somebody wants to do that math, you go for it. I'm not going to do it. But a thousand eggs, hundreds of thousands of moths. So think about all those eggs are hatching out and they turn into this caterpillar. You guys have ever had a fresh ear of corn? Um, they also are in apples sometimes and other kinds of fruit. And you found that little caterpillar hanging out inside. Look at the damage they do to crops. So farmers are spraying pesticides to keep the bugs away. And we are paying more money because the farmers are having to spend more money. But bats are eating. A Mexican free tail bat can eat 40 moths a night. So I will do this math for you at Old Tunnel because I have done it many times before. That means our full colony of 3 million bats could consume 120 million moths every single night. Then you times that times 100 million bats that are around Central Texas. So you can see the impact for agriculture. Uh, if you think about Bracken Cave, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the cave outside of San Antonio. They have 20 million bats that they say consume over 250 tons of insects a night. So a whole, uh, the impact on agriculture is immense. They did a study back in 2011 across the United States and this is pretty amazing to me. So this shows the impact that bats are making up for agriculture across the United States. So we have 47 species in the United States, and most of those are insectivores. And in this study, they proved that bats in the United States are saving farmers about $22.9 billion each year that they don't have to spend on pesticide because the bats are doing such a great job. Here in Texas, just to give you an example, a little closer to home, some graduate students did a study over in Uvalde where they grow a lot of corn crops and they have Frio bat cave over there with about 15 million bats. And in their study, they showed that in one year, bats are saving farmers in that area about $1.7 million that they don't have to spend on pesticides. So the impact, it trickles down to us. We save money and farmers save money, but I think even more importantly, it's less poisons being sprayed on some of the things that we want to eat. So. That's the importance of bats. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes and show the videos if that's okay. All right. So let me get out of here and we'll go. I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing. I'll share it again in a minute. So I'm going to open up my files here. I have to take off my glasses. Here we go. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to share my screen. Just a moment here. All right. So this was the striped face bat that I wanted to show you, you guys. I was going to get you to guess the name of the bat. And I was going to tell you to look at the, his face, and that would give you a hint that he's called a striped face, striped face bat. 
Uh, but more importantly, though, I want to show you the video um, from the old tunnel just a second. So, Nope. All right. It's going to thwart me one way or the other, I suppose. But I mean, again, you can hear it, but you can't see it. Uh, let me see. What else was I going to show you? The Oh, the nectar feeding bats. Just a second. Oh, here we go. Here's the video of the, there you go, of the, how they were studying that flight. So you can see all the little um, drops of light. All those were sensors that were sent to the computer, the, how the bat was manipulating their wings. And then what happened is the computer regenerated the flight. And this is what it looked like. Just a second. So that's what, and that's how, when they were designing those drone planes, they were using that flight and a lot of the mechanisms that they were using, which is kind of cool, pretty cool. I like to show this to kids because, it, you know, some kids aren't really into nature, they're into technology, and it kind of gives them an idea of how bats are helpful in that way as well. And then I'll show you, this is the bat going in for a landing. So check it out, how he grabs on with his thumbs. This again was just another part of that research of how bats use their wings to um, manipulate in flight and for other reasons as well. Here's a really cool um, vampire bat running. I wanted to show you guys this. This is uh, this is what they look like. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's in slow motion, and I know it's a little creepy, but I think it's kind of cool. Look at the muscles in their back. See how strong they are? Pretty amazing. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. And then I have the... Oh, here we go. This is the um, nectar bath. So it's saying how they feed on the agave. This is some video of them actually doing that out in the wild. There are kind of like hummingbirds, these nectar feeding bats. They go in really quickly. They can hover a little bit you know, when they're flying. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, a friend of mine uh, lived along the border of uh, Arizona and um, Mexico, New Mexico area. And she would put up her hummingbird feeders at nighttime. And she'd go in the morning and they were empty. And she just said, what's going on? And I said, I know what's happening. And so I, we set up a, a infrared camera, and this is what it looks like. This is what was going on. That's, that's, that's their wings fluttering. That's the Wilma got to witness these bats when we were in New Mexico at the Southwest Research Station. Pretty cool stuff. And let me see if I can find the one with them. Uh, the one where you can see her tongue. Um, here we go, though. Let me show you this. This is the vampire bats feeding on the wild pig, which is pretty cool. So, uh, again, it's in the dark, so it's, that's why he looks like he's blowing. Mm -hmm. They fight over his ear. It must be tasty, tasty blood there on <laughs> But look, in a moment, watch their little cute face. so cute. so cute. Anyways, all right. And then let me just... <laughs> Let me end with a little carnage and I will show you the domestic beetles. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, let me see if I can find it though. Domestic I don't, I don't think that's it. 
Oh, you know what? They're not, it's not going to play. It's going to be one of the ones that don't play. I can see that already. So let me just see one more if I can find the one. Here we go. I'll end on a good note, then I won't show you the carnage. Oh, no, I won't. Anyways, I'll try to post those videos to Facebook so you guys can see them. All right. So sorry about that with all the technical difficulties. But does anybody have any questions for me before I say goodbye and uh, fly uh, off into the night? Once again? There was a, a viewer on Zoom. It's, they want to know about the construction that's going on in the tunnel. Did you answer that? Construction? Yeah. They, they saw some construction. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, we have, we built a fence. Oh, okay. Yeah, we built, built a fence at the park, okay. but we had no, no construction in the tunnel. I would be really upset if that happened. <laughs> there was a, a, a very um, a incident that happened when we weren't there. Uh, somebody threw, threw a drone into the tunnel, mm -hmm. and um, it was very upsetting. But um, the bats, we do sometimes have some wintering bats. That hang out with us and oh, we, um, we and the um, um, but no, no construction in the tunnel, just a new fence. Try to make things better and also direct people into one area. Now everybody has to have a ticket to come out to the tunnel. So if you do think you're gonna come and visit, it's very important to take note that you have to have a that viewing ticket to get into the park after five, no matter um, if you're at the upper or lower viewing area. But it's only two dollars for the upper moon area. I think you can handle that. Yes. Oh, thank you for asking that. So white nose, are you guys familiar with white nose? So white nose was discovered in 2006 on some hibernating bats. And it's a naturally occurring fungus that's found in caves. It's not natural to the United States. Somehow it came over here from Europe. And when they went into the cave in the spring to, you know, to see how many bats were still hanging out, they found 98% of the colony was dead. And so what happens is fungus eats into their wing membranes and it's, a, it's an irritant. And it doesn't kill them, but they wake up from hibernation and they use up all their energy stores and they die of starvation. Since 2006, it has spread across the United States. And unfortunately, it was found in Texas. Um, um, I unfortunately found the first bat in Texas that had the fungus and it was on a free-tailed bat that we found in the winter at Old Tunnel. It did, free-tailed bats won't die from it because they don't hibernate, they migrate. However, they could spread it to other species. And so it has been found on myotis bats and some tricolored bats. And both of those are hibernating bats. And they haven't found big die-offs from it. Uh, there's a lot of great things going on in terms of research. Um, and a lot of good things are coming out of this research. And two of the things that are really promising is first, they discovered when you look for um, evidence that the bats have had the fungus growing on them, you look for scarring and it fluoresces with UV light. And so when we capture the bats, we would shine this UV light onto their wings, membranes, so you could see the scarring in it. And so they had bats in the lab that they were doing that with. And they found that the, the UV light stopped the fungus from growing. And so they're testing out these UV lights in bigger versions in caves to make sure that it doesn't kill anything else in the cave. And that might be something. But also um, nature, again, another great example of nature finding a way. Some of the bats that were dying off from the fungus have built up resistance to it and they are surviving even with the fungus. So they can pass those genetic traits down. And hopefully, you know, that will continue to do so. In the meantime, they have protected some endangered species that were possibly going to disappear forever. Uh, they built um, artificial habitats for them to make sure that they don't just totally disappear. So that's also a good thing, too. But yeah, good research. Yes? Is the guano harvested for fertilizer? Yeah. Not from Old Tunnel. Other caves did so. Bracken, for instance. Um, it has stopped uh, because of white nose. Uh, the fungus can be spread by people as well as bats, and so they are just trying to protect it. So I, they're no longer harvesting guano in Texas that I know of um, out, out of the caves. But yet, definitely, bracken used to do it for sure. Garden Ridge Nursery, if you're familiar with that, they used to bag it up and sell it for fertilizer. Yes. <laughs> And they're gone. Yep. So they come for like five, sometimes six weeks, but then they're gone until 
That's a lot of times that's how Oh yeah, her question was she has a bat house and she only has bats in the spring and then again in the fall. And that's a lot of how bat houses work because uh, bats are looking for places to stop over during migration time. So uh, you may not get them to stay there, but you're providing them a really great habitat that they need. Especially if you have a water source nearby, drought is a serious thing for bats like any other animal. So they're they looking for water. Stay over winter when it's cold. Yeah. And they also that was a terrible thing for bats, yeah. I did get something good out of the breeze, though. I have a lot. If you come out to Old Town, you'll see taxidermy bat specimens. You know, I I don't like uh, a bat. I, I don't feel good about catching a live bat and showing it to people. I think that bats need to be free and flying, not held in my hands to show you know, a bunch of people. But I do think that it's important that bats, that people see bats up close. And all, the only way they can do that is to see a dead one. And, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing. But it's the only way you're going to see them up close. And so I have quite a, I've tried to collect this specimen collection. And um, as I mentioned before, albinos do happen. When, one in a million. We usually, you know, you can see them. They stick out in the crowd because they're, mm -hmm. you know, variations. Some are totally white. Some are white body with dark wings or vice versa. Well, the, the die off, the freeze a lot in South Texas, a bunch of bats under the bridges died. And the biologists down there, um, they had just bags and bags of bats. It was very sad to look at, but he got an albino. And I said, what? And he, I said, can I have it? And he said, because yeah. I'm like, you didn't throw it away. And he had it in his freezer. So I now have an albino uh, specimen, which is pretty cool. So he's my friend. He's going, when I leave Parks and Wildlife, that bat's going with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was very proud. I did a great job. It's hard, it's hard to taxidermy a bat, if you can imagine. I don't taxidermy any other animals, by the way. So don't ask me deer or whatnot. That's not <laughs> Only bats. Very difficult. Yes. So you said a lot of when we lost a lot of bats under the bridges. Are you familiar with the Ben Ficklin and San Angelo? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a bridge where there was well known bats. Yeah. It seemed to be farther south that that was the issue, uh, which is unusual. Cause, <laughs> but I guess because the temp northern bats are more used to those kinds of temperatures, and they may not be hanging out under the bridges. They might have gone elsewhere, whereas in the south, they probably just stay there because it, they're year round because it doesn't get too cold for them in there. And that's probably why they froze. We did have some bats wintering in the tunnel and I was concerned, but we do keep track of temperature, humidity ranges and things like that. And they were fine. Uh, it did get in the one one day it got into the like 10 degrees or something, but it didn't stay that way for very long. And the bats. The wintery bats were they were roosting right in the middle of the tunnel and you know really close to one another and there were maybe probably a few thousand and they were fine they didn't, i was i was my heart and my stomach i thought i was going to find them all and the beetles are dormant in the winter time so i was just terrified to find a bunch of bats on the ground and i cry when that happens it's very sad <laughs> when i first started an old tunnel um i was i'm all about the bats People are okay, but bats are awesome. And so <laughs> these bats got caught up on this bush right over the overhang, and oh god! And so I, I was I moved my foot around the the fence, and I hung out over the edge, and I, the people were there too. I just finished my talk, and I was holding on with my foot, trying to get these bats off, and just crying and crying and crying. They were probably like, "Gosh, she really loves her job." <laughs> I, and I wasn't even thinking about falling. I'm glad that my bosses didn't see me do that. I'd probably get in trouble. Don't put the scratch that part, edit that part out of it. <laughs> Any other questions for me? Anyone? All right. Thank you guys. Thank for you.